Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this very interesting watch right here. This is the um, Tudor Watches Pelagos Left Hand Drive model. Um, so, uh, anyways, first off, I want to thank very much my buddy Aaron Shapiro. He is a watch blogger par excellence, and overall a nice guy, and uh, he uh, actually ended up with one of these guys and was interested in checking out a Planet Ocean, and we ended up arranging a trade where his pretty much damn near new inbox Pelagos went my way and my Planet Ocean went his way, because honestly, the Planet uh, Planet Ocean, that is, was just a little too heavy, a little bit too bulky. Just, it wasn't quite working out for me. It wasn't getting wrist time, so I gave this a shot, and uh, so thanks for that, Aaron. Uh, next thing, let's do some size measurement on this guy. It's a, kind of a big one. Um, in terms of the overall bracelet width, you're looking at 22 millimeters here. The overall uh, width across, we're looking at 45, including the crown. Um, the excluding the crown, you're looking at about 42.3. Lug to lug distance is non-trivial here. We're coming in right around 50 millimeters lug to lug. And then the, the, the the mace, uh, the, the most interesting dimension on this guy is the width of the, uh, or I'm sorry, the height of the watch overall. That is 14.2 millimeters. Holy crap, is that big. Um, and so this is a, a big one in terms of uh, overall dimensionality. It's it's a large watch. So there's that. Um, next thing, who, who the heck is Tudor watches? Um, and by the way, it's Tudor is in T-U-D-O-R, not as in T-U-T-O-R. You know, you didn't learn anything from the Tudor here. Well, I learned some things, but that's beside the point. Um, Tudor is actually a sister brand to Rolex, the the, the, the the big old Rolex you're, you're used to. Tudor is a sister brand to them. Tudor is where they're doing a lot of their innovation these days. They're trying to create watches, I think, that appeal to people of a more budget-conscious audience. Um, and more more specifically, it's um, it's kind of Rolex without all the silliness that's making modern Rolex unattractive these days. Like, you can actually walk into a store and buy one of these at retail price. Whoa, imagine that. But anyways, um, so Tudor's got a lot of excitement going on here, and this is one of their pieces. And um, then finally, another note, this is the left-hand drive model, the LHD. And uh, what this means is a couple of different things. I mean, to start with, it is left-hand drive. That's right, the crown is on the, the, the left side here. You do not need to adjust your displays, as opposed to on most watches where it comes in on the right side. Big difference there, although actually it doesn't affect the right-hand wearing of this guy at all. And you can might uh, maybe even argue that it's a little bit more ergonomic this way, because you end up with uh, nothing when you bend your wrist up. There's nothing to uh, interfere with it. So, I, you know, I, that's not really a problem. The only thing is it's a little counterintuitive to try and wind the watch with your left hand, but it's an automatic, so it doesn't really come up much. Didn't mind that part, but you also get uh, a cream-colored loom rather than, you know, uh, just stock white. Um, the original one always felt a little bit sterile for me. You get the red-colored Pelagos text down at the bottom there, and um, you get a date wheel, which is a roulette-style date wheel, which I will show you right now by going to use the quick set and... Let's see here. Yeah, so see, it goes red, uh, black, red, black, red, black as you go throughout there. So, um, yeah, and actually here, I'll move this in general just so you can see all the text on the dial. Hey, the time changed. Amazing magic, right? Um, so anyways, that's the left-hand drive model. And each one of them, by the way, is numbered, although it is not a limited edition. They haven't said how many of these they're going to make. We just know that they've made more than 660 of them. So, uh, well, at least way more than that. So anyways, there you go. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the good, the great the bad and the ugly of your Tudor Pelagos right here. So on the good side, to start with, this is a fully brushed watch. Now, this is not great from a jewelry perspective, but at the same time, um, it does lend it a, a certain scratch resistance. Yeah, it's definitely scratched up. It's titanium. Of course, it's going to scratch up. But the simple fact is that it, it doesn't show it that well, or it doesn't show the scratch it too, too, too terribly. I mean, actually, I, I like that a lot. And it also lends this guy overall a very tool watchy aesthetic relative to something like this Monta Ocean King here, which has a great deal more reflectivity scattered around the case. So that can be a good thing. But, um, and if you like the tool watch aesthetic, it certainly is. So there's that. Um, next thing, this has a very nice movement in it. Um, it is an in-house movement. Uh, this is one of the new ones with in-house movements. See, I'm trying desperately to figure out which way I got to rotate. I have to flip it over sometimes to get my muscle memory working. Um, but aside from that, that it's, that's about the only problem with it. Um, but anyways, it has an in-house movement. Um, it is an anti-magnetic movement. Uh, it has a date with quick set, as you just saw. It has a 70-hour power reserve, which is actually quite nice and kind of impressive there. It is an automatic movement, but it can hand wind. It hacks uh, when you pull the, the, the second or uh, the, the third position. And accuracy-wise, it's been running about uh, minus three seconds per day day consistently in pretty much all your positions. I think at the absolute worst position on my time grapher, it shows up at negative five. So it's on the wrist, it's about negative three, and that's within the cost spec. So there you go. Um, next thing, the uh, left-hand crown, like I mentioned, is actually kind of a nice thing because if you're putting on, for instance, a, a backpack or you're putting on a jacket or something, having the big crown on this side can tend to be a little snaggy. 
Whereas having it over here really isn't. So that's kind of nice. And frankly, ergonomics, it, the, like I said, the only downside is it's a little weird to wind and then to do the screw down crown, but I can live with that. That's not a big deal. Next thing, as it says right here, it is a 500 meter water resist, 1,640 feet. Now, putting aside the fact that humans don't generally go down to that depth anyways, um, but it, that is means you just don't have to worry about water with this guy. And in fact, it even includes a helium escape valve, which you just do not need. Like if you're looking at this thinking, oh, wow, what do I need that for? The answer is you do not need it. Um, a very, very small proportion of divers doing saturation diving may need a helium escape valve, but uh, you don't. So, it's marketing it's that's really all that it is but hey at least it's flush fitting it's not like the big wart sticking off the sides of some of the omegas so that's kind of nice um uh, so it but the nice thing is good water resistance can't argue with that next thing the bezel on this guy is quite nice as a, a satisfying click um it has a very nice coining on the, the the edge of the bezel there is very nice and it just feels really nice in the in the hand overall, and it has a stronger detent at, at the uh, 12 o'clock line than it does anywhere else, which is quite good. Um, I think this is just a really nice, satisfying bezel relative to the planet Ocean, relative to a lot of what's out there. This just feels very good. It feels very solid. No argument with that whatsoever. Next thing, this is super legible. You look down at this at any time of day or night, and you can immediately see what time it is. This is a readable without your glasses on sort of watch depending how much your glasses prescription is. Uh, but the snowflake hands are great for that. Having these uh, the square on here really clearly distinguishes the hour hand, and more so than just sort of a, a length-based, or in this case length and a little bit of width-based hour hand. Um, I do like that a lot, and yet it's not stealing, for instance, the, the, the Mercedes hands off a of Rolex, which is something I think they've kind of earned at this point. That's just theirs. And so having the snowflake hands actually is quite nice. Um, it, Not everybody's going to be a big fan of it. My wife, for instance, called this my ugly watch after, well, actually, Actually, this usurped the crown from the Breitling Aerospace. But still, um, I, I really do like that snowflake, and it makes it very, very, very readable. Um, and especially having this white on black, even in low light conditions where the loom hasn't yet kicked in, um, it is absolutely 100% readable. That's pretty nice. Um, next thing, the bracelet on this guy is pretty solid. Um, it is a screw-in link bracelet here, so you can see that you got screws down there. Um, you have, in addition to the, um, the clasp, which is actually quite nice, um, you have a just, it's overall, it's comfortable. It, it moves very nicely. There's not really a whole lot of concern to it. Um, it's it's very solid. There's not a whole lot of give to it in either direction. Um, and the other thing that it's got actually going on here is a diver's uh, extension, which, mind you, you don't need. But uh, still, it's in there. I mean, okay, maybe you need it if you are a diver type, but most people are not. So, you know, there it is. But anyways, so it's got the diver's extension along with the clasp. And the clasp on this guy is pretty great um, in that it has not only uh, just a, a normal clasp here. You can see here, this is the clasp on it, but it's very easy to uh, engage and it's very difficult to accidentally disengage because you just pull up on this guy. This is, It's just, it's well designed such that it takes very little force. You can see some little ceramic ball bearings there seem to be holding things in position, but it takes a lot of force to, you know, get it loose without trying to, you know, without using the little flip-up guy. Look, it's just, it's a solid clasp, but more importantly, this actually includes a really nice set of features. Um, one of which is uh, the tool is quick adjust system. So what you can see here is if we look underneath here, there is a little area here where you've got a, let's see if I can show you, yeah, right there, you got those little tongues. And note that tongue fits into any number of these grooves, but then past a certain point, if you go all the way out there, it goes into this zone. And at this zone, all that you've got are these two springs right here, and those two springs are in control. And so if you pull the bracelet out, the springs pull the bracelet back. It can it basically maintains a spring tension here. And so as you're wearing this guy, it keeps going, 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 going until eventually it stops because the springs, it hits a, a stopping point. But what this basically means is that this is an infinite quick adjust in this, but it's always going to be kept tight. Um, although if you go to these first three buttons here, then it's uh, a little bit trickier. So um, that's actually quite nice. Um, it, you've got the choice of having three areas, you have, of having three adjustments or of using the spring. No complaints there. Um, and so I like very much that this has a toolless quick adjust as well as the spring mode, and that's that's pretty good too. Um, this also does, by the way, come with a rubber strap that uses the same end links. It literally just slots right in there. It looks pretty solid. It doesn't use a deployant clasp or anything like that, um, so I didn't end up really using it, but it is absolutely there, and it's absolutely a factor. Um, next thing on this guy is this uses a titanium construction. Like, most of this watch is titanium. I believe the case back and the clasp is steel. Um, but 
everything else is TI, and you know what? It works great, um, because titanium's a nice metal. It's nice, it's warm, um, it feels good on the skin in general, but the other thing about it is that it is um, pretty lightweight, um, or at least it is a much lighter weight thing than the steel, and that's actually quite good. Um, it doesn't make the watch light, but it makes it lighter. We'll throw this guy on the scale right here. Come on, scale, work with me. There we go. Comes in at 4.9 ounces here, and that's um, actually not that bad. And, uh, so uh, the, having the titanium on there is a big advantage. Um, and so uh, that, that that's good. And then finally, I got to say, I do like the left-hand drive uh, aesthetics on it very much. Um, here, I'll try and clean this off a little bit, because one of the things I like a lot is that there is a, uh, it, it's got this little bit of red text on the dial. It's got a little bit of cream coloring to the indices. It just makes this guy a lot more interesting overall. Um, it, 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 it takes it from being stock black and white into something that's a little bit more nuanced. There's a little bit of color to it, even just a little tiny bit, and that makes a big difference to me. I had seen the original Pelagos. I'd lost it over the original Pelagos, but it wasn't until I saw the left-hand drive version, which was when I was already wearing a Planet Ocean, um, that it was like, oh, yeah, I want that. And so if I was going to have any Pelagos, it would be this model. So um, that, to me, is the good, is the left-hand drive adds both some aesthetic touches as well as some uh, the, the left handy thing. Um, it's titanium. It's got a rubber strap, a great clasp on a solid bracelet. It's very legible with a great bezel, solid water resistance, left-hand crown, um, which can actually be nice, a good movement, and it is fully brushed, which makes for a nice tool watch aesthetic. On the uh, great side, the loom on this watch is just incredible. This is a loom beast, 100%. I'm going to go ahead and charge it off camera here with a heavy-duty flashlight, although, frankly, I barely need to. But you can see here that the loom on this is not only really strong, but it's every Everywhere. The bezel is fully loomed with serious hardcore loom. The indices are fully loomed with serious hardcore loom. It is a well done watch in that domain. You read this, you, you can read this guy all night long with no questions whatsoever. And given the legibility of the hands, given the differentiation of the hour hand, this is one of the best overnight watches that I'm just aware of. Um, it, it's just absolutely beautifully, beautifully legible and just as legible overnight as it is during the day. This is one of those watches where if you charge it with a flashlight, it lights up the wall next to you where you're walking. That's an impressive little piece. And so to me, at least, that's actually what's great. I'm a loom snob and this... This does satisfy. And so that's what's great to me. On the bad side, um, there are a couple of issues here. I mean, to start with, um, it is using an in-house movement. Now, it's not the case that uh, Tudor, uh, that the Pelagos always did. Uh, originally, it was using an ETA off-the-shelf sort of movement. And, uh, you know, certainly there's something to be said for an in-house movement in terms of horology, in terms of, you know, uh, for the brand and whatnot. Um, but the thing is, and, and it is nice that you get the anti-magnetism, that you get the better power reserve. But at the same time, you pay a price and that you're going to have to send this to Tudor for servicing because because not everyone else is going to have access to parts. Um, and so you just kind of need to be realistic. Realize that in-house movement is usually just, that just means, hey, we found a way to make it more expensive and sell your service costs. Um, and that's not necessarily something you want. And so you shouldn't rule out the old tutors. The other big deal, by the way, with the in-house movement is they became chronometers. Um, they, they are now certifying the accuracy for them, whereas previously they were not. And so that's that's just not stellar. Um, but there you go. Just be realistic about that. Another thing that I am missing from this guy is uh, the independent hour hand. Uh, one of the things I loved about the Planet Ocean, and I love about a bunch of quartz watches, is the ability to move the hour hand independently of the minute hand and second hand stopping. So you can keep your accuracy over a longer period of time. Mind you, you know, on a mechanical, they're not as often, usually you have to reset the seconds anyways for accuracy. But you know, hey, um, it, it's always something nice, especially if you're doing a lot of flying back and forth, where you need to adjust time zones regularly. Not a big deal, but it's a deal. Next thing, on the mechanical, or on the adjust Class here. I gotta be honest with you, I'm not 100% convinced by this particular approach. Actually, hold on just a second. Let me grab my Breitling Aerospace just to show you the alternative. So, this guy is using a spring based system, like I showed you there. And I wasn't able to adjust it so that these first three settings worked for me because, well, the links are relatively large here. There's not so much adjustment you can do except to get it in that range. Luckily, on my wrist, I tend to be right at the bottom of this little range here, on the spring range. Um, the, the, the nice part about this guy is that it is never loose. Um, there is no possibility of this guy, when you're in spring mode, being loose on your wrist. Um, the, the frustrating part is that it is always just a little bit tight. And so there were definitely days where, uh, for whatever reason, my wrist was pretty, mm, was a little swelled up there. 
too much salt, I freaking something. Um, and as a result, uh, this guy just felt really, really tight. And unfortunately, there is just no way to stop it at a later point in the spring or two. There's no way to, you know, pull it out to here and stop it. So unless you want to deploy the divers class, or divers extension, which adds a whole bunch of length to it, you kind of just stuck with it being extra tight there on the wrist. And it gets harder and harder to pull that spring as you get bigger and bigger there. Not something necessarily that I love. And so I do think I prefer an approach like Breitling is using here on this rubber clasp where you've got a little button in there and you can kind of pop it back and forth and you can pick the size that, that works well for you at that very moment. Sure, uh, you'll have to fiddle with it a little bit more often, but usually that's something closer to once a day. Um, and it, it, it's always going to be at a level that's pretty comfortable for you. And so, although it's very good that there is a um, that, that, that there is a quick adjust clasp, and by the way, I'm not necessarily convinced with this part either because it's just letting stuff get up into the works in there. But anyways, I'm not fully convinced that this spring-loaded solution solution is actually a better solution for quick adjust, but you know what? It's definitely better than no quick adjust at all. And so there you go. Um, and I got to applaud Tudor for going there and they absolutely need to put this in the rest of their watch lineup because guys, that's one of the things stopping a lot of people on the black days. Seriously, not that Tudor cares what I think. Um, the next thing, the titanium is titanium. So it's going to scratch up more readily than stainless steel. That's just the simple fact of what titanium is and how it functions in the world. Um, it's just not as hard, at least in the way that it's generally Really, you know, manufactured. So as a result, you got to be content with some scratching, some things like that. Not the end of the world, but it's a thing. Next thing, the dial on this guy is all paint. I mean, if we look at the dial here, I mean, sure, there's a lot of, there is a little bit of detail and a little bit of height here. You can see that the indices are actually slightly raised up, and that actually, if we looked when the loom was running, you can see that there is an area of what looks to be a plastic, and then the loom is inside that. So it's not actually here. I can probably show that off. Yeah, so you can see there's the little plastic area there, and then the loom is inside it. So it's slightly raised, uh, which does make a difference. And you can see the, there's a raised rehout and whatnot around there. But honestly, I, I wasn't super impressed with the overall. The, the, the dial on it is very low-key. There's nothing really jewelry. There's nothing really sparkly about it. Um, that certainly, it's a tool watch. That's kind of the aesthetic, but it's it's a little bit weird. It feels a little flat, a little painty, and that's not necessarily something you, you're going to want. Maybe it is. Who knows? But that's something that bothers me a little bit. Um, speaking of things that bother me a little bit, Tudor, could you write anything else on this damn dial? I mean, seriously, Tudor, Geneva, okay, Geneva, Swiss made, redundant, thank you. Um, Pelagos, chronometer, officially certified, rotor self-winding, dude, it's a freaking dive watch. Every dive watch is rotor self-winding at this point. 500 meters, yeah, it says that on the back. All you need to have right here is Pelagos, really, that's it. You don't even need the freaking Swiss mate. I mean, it doesn't mean anything anyways. But that, that, to me, the, the, the paragraph on the freaking dial doesn't really do much for me. And having the at least the Pelagos is written in red, which makes it a little bit less like, you know, it was the best at times, it was the worst at times on a bunch of the freaking... Ah. But that, that, that it just it bugs me a little bit. Um, Next thing, this guy, like I said, is still a little bit heavy. I mean, I threw this guy on the scale and it comes in at like 4.9 ounces, something along those lines. And you know what? That's about the same way is a reasonably sized steel watch. So, um, you know, it's as heavy as a normally sized steel watch. You know, the other watch that I've been wearing a lot lately, the Monta Ocean King, is about the same weight as this guy, despite being made entirely of steel. So really, making the Pelagos here out of titanium is a lot like ordering three Big Macs, two extra large fries, and a Diet Coke. I mean, yes, it's healthier, but it's not actually healthy. Uh, similarly, this guy out of titanium is lighter, but it's not actually light. Um, titanium is just making it less heavy than it would have been without using titanium. It's just hiding their sins in terms of sizing here. Um, and that, to me, is, is just not great. I, when I got this guy, I, I, you know, I kind of hoped okay, titanium, it's going to feel super light. You know, you handle it in this store and you don't get a real sense like, oh, once I get all the... But it just, it still feels like about the same weight as a normal watch. It's just not as heavy as it would be otherwise, like the freaking Planet Ocean, which was made entirely out of steel. So there you go. And then finally, on the bad side, the price on this is high. It's 4400 bucks is the retail price, and that's that's a good amount of money, especially for something like this that registers as tool watch first and foremost, where there's no polishing on the damn thing, where the finishing to it is, you know, skillful application of loom and, you know, little plastic buckets that hold the loom well. I mean, it's nicely done. There's nothing I can really point to and say, well, okay, there are some things I can point to and say, I do better. But at the same time, um, it's not like it's 
it's a bad watch, but it doesn't have that same kind of polishing. It doesn't have that same jewelry feel to justify that. And, and so it, considering, I think the market agrees because these guys, although it's 4,400 in retail, um, they're going on the secondary market for about 35, 34, someplace in that domain. Um, and that's the level at which I think this really feels right. Um, and that's about what I had in mind for trade value because the Planet Ocean was absolutely well loved by the point uh, that Aaron got it. So, you know, I feel like this is just, the, the price is a little bit up there. And so you should see if you can work with an AD to try and get a, a better deal on the Tudor here. And see if you can do better than retail because 4400 is pretty steep. Or you can buy one used like I did and get out of it a little better. But um, that, that, that price to me is high. And in fact, that's the bad. The price is high. It is still very heavy despite being titanium. Could you write anything else on the damn dial there, Tudor? The dial is kind of all paint. Um, and that's not stellar. The titanium scratches up pretty uh, easily. The, the, the springy adjust is nice at some level, but not great in other levels. The um, independent hour hand lacking is, well, lacking. Um, and the in-house movement can be a good thing, but it also can be a not good thing, so just keep that in mind as you're uh, using it there. On the ugly side, there is one ugly issue, and that is just the thickness of this damn watch. This watch is really, really, really thick. Um, it's incredibly thick. I don't freaking get it. I mean, remember back when high horology involved making your watches smaller and thinner, when people would be like, wow, that's amazing. That's a really thin watch. That shows that you have mastery. Well, I don't think Tudor remembers that. I mean, actually, that's not true because they've, they've, they're they've starting to learn their lesson. They recently released the Black Bay 58 because the Black Bay is another one of these slab-sided watches that's, you know, four millimeters higher than it needs to be. Um, and they have released a new model of that, the Black Bay 58, that thins things out pretty considerably. And I'm really hoping that we see the same thinning sort of thing for the Pelagos. But as a result, um, given that it is this thick, it's just kind of awkward, honestly. It's got a high center of gravity, and on the wrist, it sticks up a fair amount. Even with this part kind of pressed in there, this is just a really thick watch. And, you know, anytime I was wearing shirt cuffs, I just wasn't loving it. And so, to me, I really feel like that's ugly. I, I don't see a reason why this needs to be that damn thick. Part of me is scared that it might be the helium escape valve controlling a lot of that, because that's not necessary either. But uh, still, I, I don't love that, and considering uh, it just it doesn't do it for me. And so, to me, that's what's ugly, is that this is just so damn thick, and I don't know why it has to be that way. Um, and in fact, Tudor has just shown us that it does not with the Black Bay 58, so get on it, guys. Final conclusions. Look, um, at some level, I like this watch a lot. It is a great tool watch, 100%. It tells the time well. It is incredibly legible. Um, it has all the information on it that you need. It's got a date window, which is important to it, damn it. Um, it has none of the information you don't need, and it does all of that pretty reliably with very little fuss and muss. Um, it, it does have some downsides. It's needlessly texty. It's needlessly heavy. It's needlessly tall. And kind of the killer is that it's also needlessly expensive. But on the whole, it is a nice watch. And if somebody said to me, hey, Nick, this is your last watch, congratulations, um, then okay, no problem, I can work with that. But there are a few ways that I can kind of conclude this finally. One question that I've been asked a lot is, well, how does it compare to the Planet Ocean? How does how does that comparison look? Um, you know, honestly, the Planet Ocean was a better watch in the jewelry sense, and actually in a few ways. I like the quick adjust mechanism on the Planet Ocean a little bit better. It had better finishing by a mile. It had a nicer movement. It was more accurate. Um, and frankly, it was just better as jewelry. There was more to it where you, you looked at the Planet Ocean, and you felt like, wow, yeah, I can see why I'm paying a lot of money for this. That said, the Tudor is actually a better watch for me by a fair margin, because it is a little thinner, which is amazing. That shows you how damn thick the Planet Ocean was. It is lighter than the Planet Ocean. Um, it is less expensive than the Planet Ocean was. Um, it is a little bit less flashy, and well, I'm a tool, so a tool watch kind of fits me well. Let's be real here. And if you gave me a choice between, you know, the Planet Ocean and the Tudor, like if I could send a letter back through time saying, Nick, Nick, it's me from the future. What should you buy? Yeah, I would probably tell myself to buy the, 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 the Planet, or I'm sorry, the, the Tudor here. I mean, had the left-hand drive been available back when I bought it, oh, that would have been, that would have been nice. But, um, yeah, should you buy a Pelagos in general is another fair question to ask. And the answer there is a definitive maybe. It is a great watch, and particularly if you love Loom and the Deep Blue Sea, then you're going to enjoy it. But there are the two big issues. I mean, at one level, it's kind of weird 
in terms of pricing, you know, it's an all business, no jewelry, $4,400 wristwatch. That's a lot of money to spend on a wristwatch by, by a huge margin. That's, um, it's kind of weird, honestly. The fact that you have something that is that expensive, but without the high end finishing, without a lot of that, the end result is very strange. It's a luxury watch in terms of price, but it's not a luxury watch necessarily in terms of the feeling, in terms of the, I mean, it's, it's a great watch, absolutely, but I don't know that it's, it's that much great. I mean, it ends up in a really weird place in the curve of diminishing returns where there's very little they've done wrong on it you know thickness aside but that's not even a but it's it's still it feels really really pricey and honestly i think the bigger issue with the price is the competition because at its core this is a three-hand diver tool watch with crazy lube and there are a lot of watches out there that especially if you don't need the brand which is certainly a factor and you don't want an in-house movement uh, which offer a large percentage of what this is offering or in some cases even more for similar or less amounts of cash i mean the grand seiko spring drive diver brings you the seiko spring drive movement which is insanely accurate really really cool it's also titanium i think it's a little bit more money although a good ad can probably help you out um but you know that's kind of a neat approach and that's something that you know this really can't touch um the omega seamaster professional the new 300 with the wave dial again brings a lot more jewelry factor, but at the same time, you, you've got, a, a, I think, a nicer movement. The coaxial movements are really nice, really accurate generally. You've got a little bit more in the way of bling to it, which is nice. Maybe a better adjustability in the clasp, but it's certainly smaller, less thick, um, but it's at the same price point as this guy is, and so that's a little awkward. If you're willing to go a little further down the range, you know, Seiko has no shortage of loomtastic divers, albeit usually with pretty bad bracelets, all throughout their price range. For some reason, they don't go to great bracelets and until you get to the Grand Seiko, like adjustability range, and that's that's a little frustrating. Um, for me personally, the Manta Ocean King here it turns out to be really good competition here because it, in terms of finishing, it's. Uh well above and beyond, I feel like. Um, but it also has a, it's got a movement that's very similar to the one this used to have in it. Um, but the price, it's less than half the damn price, and it's reasonably thick. That's that's kind of a very nice difference here. We'll uh, do a little bit of a comparison. Yeah. <laughs> See, this one went on the diet. Um, and frankly, if you're just looking for something like this, the Steinhardt Ocean 1500, I had a review of this guy, it's already up there, but it is similarly full titanium. It is similarly a loom beast, and is a very, very nice watch, and that's only seven hundred bucks. I mean, it's the amount of tax you pay on this guy. So, I mean, if value is of the absolute slightest concern to you, then this would be a little bit of a weird choice. 4,400 bucks isn't going all that far right here. But the other thing that you have to be uh, attentive to, even if money is not really an object for you, um, is the size thing. Because that's honestly what's pushing this guy off my wrist. I mean, the money is spent. This was a trade. It's very easy for me to just say, yep, that's, it's mine forever. Because, you know, then it, until you sell it, you never take the bath, right? Um, uh, but this guy is just too damn thick. Every time I wear this guy with a shirt with sleeves, it was just like, uh, not a big fan of that. And when I put back on a watch that's reasonably sized, it just feels bad better. It's just like, oh yeah, that's improved. And especially then with the weight and all of that, it's just, it's a, it's a thing for me. Um, and so I hope, hope, hope again that Tudor applies what they've learned from that smaller Black Bay and makes a reasonably sized Pelagos. If they make one of these that's two thirds as thick, I may be a Pelagos owner again, because there is a lot to love about this guy. And especially with the titanium, if they can get that weight even further down, oh yeah, they, 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 that, that could be a thing. But for me, that ended up being kind of the killer for this guy is, you know, just like with the Planet Ocean. Although this is lighter, that's certainly a good thing. It, just the size of it is a little unwieldy for me and my uh, 6.75 inch wrists. Um, and for me, ultimately, even though I've spent that money, this guy isn't going to stick around. This is going to go up for sale to my Patreon patrons soon. And then if not there, someplace else, not too long after. And the size thing is what did it in. And honestly, the other thing that did it in is the Monta here, because this is a very, very different watch, 100%. But at the same time, it's not, it's not titanium, but it ends up being about the same weight as this guy is, even in stainless steel. Um, and it's sized for a reasonable human. I mean, it's uh, thickness-wise, it's much better. The center of gravity is just better. And again, like I said, you could buy two of these for the price of one of the Tudor. I'm not saying they're the same watch. I'm not even saying that this is a better one, necessarily. I'm just saying that, for me, this ends up, I think, being the winner. Um, but that's kind of where I land. I, th th this guy ended up losing the war in that domain, and there were a couple of little annoyances that kept this from being damn near perfect for me. It is a beautiful watch. It's an excellent tool. It was absolutely... A 
a joy in many, many ways. But it's a so-so value. And yeah, until they do a little bit of slimming down here, right? Don't know that it's going to quite reach its full potential. But if you don't mind the thickness, hey, maybe you'll love this guy. So anyways, there you go. Hope this has been interesting to you, that you enjoyed this little bit of tutelage. There you go. And that you have yourselves just an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.